Well, good morning, Grace Life. It is so good to be with you this morning. I, I just have to say, uh, we had a staff retreat this past week, and it was an incredible time. Mandy puts that together, and then there's some work involved, but some fellowship involved. But I walk away each year that we do this staff retreat, and I am super impressed with this team. And I just want to just tell you, like, they don't all get the opportunity to come speak to you every day, every time, but there are so many beautiful people doing ministry here at Grace Life, and they care about people, they love people, they are expressing the life of Christ in their different ministries, um, and it's just incredible. And when I sit here and listen to Jesse and this team who lead us in worship every Sunday and think about yeah, the hearts there and the, the attitudes and then the, the giftedness in which they do it. I just want to say thank you to God. Thank you to you who helped support that. Our staff is amazing. And this week was an, a great opportunity to be able to see it. You can reserve your own judgment and my participation on that level. We are in the book of Ephesians, one in Christ, because, because this is exactly what God has done. He's won us because of Christ. But because of him winning us, we see the unity. And we're going to get there in chapter 4, I promise, one day. And it talks about that we are one in the Spirit, and there is one God and one Father, and it's, it's all about unity. And man, if there's anything that the gospel of Jesus declares, it's that we are unified by the love of Jesus. And if there's anything that this world so desperately needs to know and to hear and to believe and receive and then express, it's the love of God that brings unity We've been in really one long sentence for the last few weeks, uh, and we, we'll, we'll wrap up that sentence today. We saw last week, verse 11, this incredible truth that we not only have obtained an inheritance, but the, the, the Greek usage of that language literally could be translated, we have obtained an inheritance, and that we have been made an inheritance. And so we saw last week that we are God's gift to Jesus. And I don't know what you're feeling this morning as you sit where you're sitting. Uh, I don't know what you're thinking about. I don't know what experiences you've had this week. Uh, but if it's anything consistent with what typical humanity experiences, the idea that in Christ we could actually be made, made an inheritance for Jesus overwhelms me. That's who you are. That God looks out into the, the vast of humanity and he says, the children of God, those who have by grace, through faith, placed their trust in me, I have so fully redeemed, I have so fully transformed, I have so fully made new that I can now offer them to my only begotten son as the greatest gift he could ever receive for his mission work. Think about that. That's who you are. You're, you're not just given an inheritance. You became an inheritance for Jesus. And so that the old joke, I, I, I'm God's gift to the world. No, it's better than that. You're God's gift to Jesus. And for whatever that makes you have to rearrange in your thinking, whatever that makes you have to repent of, believe differently about in how you think, because a lot of how we think is motivated by what we experience and how we feel. And, and the scripture is clear. We set our minds to the truth. God wired us that we believe the truth that sets us free. And as we believe this truth of who we are in Christ, we start to live in the freedom that he provides for us. You're made an inheritance. We also saw that you are a joint heir with Christ. Whatever Jesus inherits, you inherit. Whatever you inherit, Jesus inherits. We are joint heirs, which means the moment you came to Jesus, you became God's gift to Jesus. You were made an inheritance. You also get to inherit what Jesus inherited. He inherited you. You get to be you. See, this redemption in Jesus is not what religion offers where we all conform to the same way of thinking, feeling, acting, looking, and speaking. That's boring. 
That comes from the pit of hell, not from heaven itself. We get to be the unique expressions of who God wired us to be. And there's no one like you on planet earth to uniquely express the very same life that God is. Relationship with Jesus frees us to be ourselves again, how he designed us and desired us to be. Where you don't have to hide and you don't have to pose and you don't have to bluff your way through life. You can be honest. You can even be honest about your weaknesses and frailties. You can be honest about your shortcomings because none of those identify you. None of those tell you who you really are. Those are the places and the areas of our lives where we want to grow so that we better express who we are. But we've got to believe along the way that we have been made new. So only in Jesus, only with confidence in him, only because of him are we free to really be us. It it is not trying to get us all to memorize the same verses in the same King James Bible and then speak that to one another, ye people. It is to uniquely be us. I used to love what Bill Gillum used to say, that that the life of God through him came through this Oklahoma oaky expression with his Oklahoma accent, but it was uniquely the life of God through him. And each of you has that opportunity because each of you is unique. In a very significant way. We are joint heirs with Christ. Today what we're going to see as we finish these next two verses. Before we get to this beautiful prayer of Paul's. We're going to see just how beautiful and powerful. The truth of God's heart is. Not just for some people but for all people. We're also going to see the simplicity of what faith is. That, it, that it's, it's nothing magical or mystical. It's It's simple. And, and, it, and it comes from hearing and believing, which all of us have the capacity to do. And we're going to see the security of knowing that all of this, and when I say all of this, I mean that our relationship with God is not held fast by our commitment or our gritted teeth or our ability to perform. Our relationship with God is held secure by his very own power. That's, that's how secure you are. We live with the insecurity of the daily circumstances and emotions that precede them. But we live in the eternal security of the God who holds us forever by the power of his word. That's how safe we are to be able to live this Christian life that only really Jesus can live, but he's chosen to live it in and through us. And we get to participate by faith. What a beautiful invitation from the gospel. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth that sets us free. As we look at these beautiful passages, Father, will you cement into our minds that which you have grounded and rooted our hearts in? This beautiful truth that sets us free. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Verse 12 and 13, Ephesians, Paul goes on to say, So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Tuck that little phrase away, by the way, to the praise of his glory. We're going to see it three times. Well, we've seen it once. We're going to see it two more times. We'll talk about it at the end. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, now this passage, I highlighted two pronouns for you, and we live in a world that's focusing on pronouns, but here, these pronouns really matter scripturally, and here's why. You're going to notice that when we identify what the pronouns, who they, who they make to identify our audience, we're going to see the significance of what Paul's saying. Remember who Paul is, ex-Pharisee. He's a Jew. He's come to Jesus, and his ministry has been to send the gospel beyond the Jews. It's first for the Jews. Romans told us that. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation, first for the Jew, because Jesus was Jewish. It came through a chosen group so that this effective message and gospel would would go to the world. But it wasn't to be limited to that chosen group. It was to go through them. It's first for the Jew And then for the Gentile. And here's Paul, a Jew. So he says that. We who were the first to hope. We were the first to hope in Christ. Might be to the praise of his glory. And look what he says. In him you also. So he's writing to a a Gentile, a Greek church in Ephesus. So he's letting them know. You also were included. And this is such a big deal. 
This is what it means that God loves all people. That, that, that when we see the love and the heart of God, it's not for an elite select few, for the chosen frozen, frozen chosen. No, it's, it's for all people. God loves everybody. And no stronger voice to, to prove that than to come through the Apostle Paul. He was even ostracized by his own people because he sent the gospel beyond his people to those people. God loves them. And Paul was willing to give up a rich heritage of what he had formerly believed. He was willing to give up all those feelings that he formerly had about what those people were like. For the racism between Jew and Gentile in Scripture is as strong as any racism we would ever talk about today. And Paul is willing to put all that behind him because the moment he found Jesus, he found what unifies any race. He found what, he found what unifies any division. He found a love that unifies any difference. And so he's committed to this gospel and he's committed to sending it to you also. And it's beautiful. For God so loved the world. And now we find an answer to those things that divide us, that are driven by fear and pride and ignorance. But when we come to the love of God, that there, there is no limit to the stretch and reach and offer of his love. It's his love that unifies us. It's his love that, that ends the division between groups and ethnicities and genders and peoples and, and all of that. It's his love that does that. And Paul here is committed to, to showing and telling that love to a group of people that Paul's people typically wouldn't think deserve it. We see that God's love imparts supreme value on us. You also were included, uh, you, you, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and you believed in him. Galatians 3 says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. There is neither slave nor free. The, the point is, in Christ, we find a brand new source of identity. It doesn't mean that there aren't male and female. It doesn't mean that there aren't Jews and Gentiles. And it doesn't mean that there aren't some people with more and some people with less. That's not what it means to say that in Christ, none of that exists. It says in Christ, none of that is the identity. None of that is your source of significance. And when we realize our source of, of significance our value, our worth, our acceptance, and our belonging stem from being connected to Jesus and his love for us rather than the things that we can acquire or the way we look or the things that we do on this planet. We start to find freedom from those things that we thought are giving us our identity and we've become enslaved to them. We now can break the bond of being enslaved to the things that should be the expressions of who we are rather than the identity because we find it in Christ. This is what Paul is saying. I mean, in that one, one idea, we believed in Christ. It was for the Jew first. But, but I'm here to tell you, dear church, I'm here to tell you, dear non-Jew, it's not limited to us. Yes, yes, he, he's faithful. He's faithful to a people that rejected him. He loves us still. And, and we were the first, when we hoped in him, then it's true for us. But you also, I think it's the NIV that says you also were included because that's the idea in the language. But you also, having heard and believed the gospel of your salvation, you're, you're a part of this. Imagine a, a, a people that believed they were rejected and now they, they get to be included. It's beautiful. And, and this, this idea that they heard and believed, what could be more simple than that? This is really, this is really the definition of faith. But, but before we talk about faith, I want to talk about what it is that they're to have faith in. It says the gospel. It's the gospel. The gospel of your salvation. And the gospel is more than just come to Jesus. You know this, right? The gospel isn't just come to Jesus, get your sins forgiven, and then one day when you die, you'll get to go to heaven. 
That's a part of the gospel, but I'll be really honest with you. That's a part of the gospel that doesn't really impact me today if that's all the gospel. Today, I got to live in a real world with real people, with my real self, with real obstacles, with a real enemy, with real opposition. And if all the gospel is, is that someday I get to experience him, then today, as Frank said for many years, in the meantime, it's a meantime. The gospel is greater than just come to Jesus and get your sins forgiven and go to heaven one day. It's come to Jesus and place your faith in him, your trust in him, be united to him, and be in a vital living relationship with him. And don't, don't try to imply what that may mean. It, it's, it's that you are actually related rightly to Jesus. And that your trust is not in yourself or in your works or in your ability to achieve anything or, or merit something before God. You place your faith in Christ. And, and listen, I know how that feels. When I do something, whether it's around the house or at work or whatever, I want to be recognized for what I do. I, wanna, I want somebody to say, job well done. This started when I was a little boy. This started for you when you were a little kid. When you drew something and you went to mom and dad and said, look what I did. And then they... They fostered this process by putting it on the refrigerator, and it was ugly, but you're their kid. So we've been looking for significance and recognition based on what we do for a long time, but, but here we realize coming to Jesus means I don't find my worth and significance in that anymore. I, I find it in him, and I place my faith in his finished work, knowing that he was crucified and I was crucified with him. That, that my sins may be forgiven? Absolutely. Every single one of them, past, present, and future, that he would bring them up no more. Are we forgiven? Yes. But that's a means to an end, that we would experience life. He didn't just crucify your sins. You realize by placing you into him, he crucified you, the old you that you were. That sinner, that condemnable person, that person that, that was accused rightly got crucified with Jesus. That's the gospel. So that you would be raised a brand new creation. The same way Jesus' death took away your sins is the same way Jesus' death takes away the old you. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he resurrected and we are in him, so we resurrected, and he resurrected us a brand new creation so that we could be raised new, so that we could walk in newness of life and be joined to him and live in the fullness and newness of what he offers. The gospel is so much more than some future destination change. The gospel is a transformation change right now. You've heard it. The question isn't, do you hear it? The question is, do you believe that? Do you believe it? This is what Paul is telling them. And by the way, this is not a promise of an easy or perfect life. Uh, I, uh, when, when, when we share about the new covenant, we share about the freedom we have in Jesus, we share about this being made new and righteous and holy and acceptable before God, and we're totally forgiven, and Christ now lives in us, and, and he lives his life through us, and we're connected to him. He loves us, and he said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Some people instantly hear, oh, then, then you're saying if I really trusted Jesus, my life would be perfect. Well, if you think Jesus is your life, then your life is perfect. But that doesn't mean the expression of that life on this planet is always perfect. The life on this planet does not go perfectly. And coming to Jesus is no false promise that it will. Jesus doesn't say that he's going to change all your circumstances. Jesus doesn't say that he's going to change how you look. Jesus doesn't say any of that stuff. That's not a promise. He says, I'm going to change you. I'm going to change you from within. Where you once got a, a source of significance from anything other than me, I'm going to be that source for you. I'm going to be your security. And so we go through an imperfect world with imperfect circumstances with him. With all love and peace and joy and comfort and compassion and union. So that in the midst of all of it, we recognize we have him and he has us. And, and you know this. We don't really need the circumstance to change as much as our feelings dictate that they should. 
what we really desperately need is in any circumstance, whether it changes or not, to know that he loves us, to know that we're valued, to know that we belong, to know that we're not abandoned, to know that he is for us. When we know that, then we can handle any circumstance. For we can cry out like Paul did in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so maybe we've, or, or religion or the world or whatever has set up some false finish line that trusting Jesus means that all things will go smoothly and your life will be perfect. That's not what it means. And if you want a proof in it, just read the Bible and look at all the people that have trusted Jesus. Look at Jesus who was trusting God. But we have him as we go through it. The gospel is the beautiful truth that we are united to him today. And yes, we will experience it without any opposition one day. And I look forward to that day. But I, I promise you, I, 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 don't, I don't wake up every day going, ah, oh, come on, come on, come on. Not today. Come Jesus today. Like, actually, if he comes today, great. If he doesn't, great. Didn't Paul say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain? Either way, guess what? This truth is real. We have him and he has us. Listening and believing, hearing and believing. This is the most simple definition of faith. And it's beautiful. I love what Romans 10, 17 says. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I see this this obsession in the body of Christ with faith today. Probably not new, but I see it today because I'm here today, right? Where we become obsessed with faith as though, as though faith in God means a complete ignorance or a lack of common sense or some unpredictable leap into the dark. And only then are we really trusting God. You ever feel like that? Like, like great faith in God means that I don't trust anything else. I don't believe in anything. Like, like I got to throw away common sense, intellect, wisdom. I got to throw all that stuff away if I'm going to have faith. That they're mutually exclusive. They can never work together. I, I don't believe that. I don't think scripture teaches that. Look what it says. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing from the word of Christ. The more you hear God, meaning his word, the more you hear him tell you that he loves you, he accepts you, he has forgiven you, he lives in you. He's got a plan for you, that he's got you, that he's for you. The more you hear from him, we grow in faith. We grow in faith. It's simple. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It really is a, a step in the light. I mean, think about that. That faith is not God asking you to just dismiss Every sense of counsel, every sense of common sense. Faith is saying, hey, I, I, I think it's this basic. If God is telling the truth, then trusting him, faith, makes the, not only the most sense, the only sense, and it's practical. If God is telling the truth, then faith is super practical. It's not mysterious. It's not, it's not magical. It's not presuming upon God. It doesn't activate God. I hear that taught a lot. Oh, your faith activates God. Have you ever heard something like that? If you have enough faith, then God leaps into action and he'll do something. Your faith never activates God. God is active whether you have faith or not. Your faith lets you participate in the activity of God. And there's a big difference. Otherwise, we start worshiping and idolizing faith itself as its own object. And that's, that's going to lead to all kinds of deception. That's why people say, I just don't have, have you ever said I don't have enough faith? Jesus never said that. I, I, look, I, I, don't, I don't ask that question like an accusation. I have thought that. I just don't have enough faith. So I'm hoping... I'm finding comfort in my misery that you have thought that. We tend to think sometimes we just don't have enough faith because if we had enough faith, then this situation would go differently. Jesus didn't tell us we didn't have enough faith. And maybe you're saying, oh, Tim, he said, oh, ye of little faith. That's not about amount. 
if it's about a mount, then I have, to, I have to ask, what did Jesus mean when he said the faith of a mustard seed? By the way, a mustard seed is very small. He said the faith, faith of a mustard seed could move a mountain. What is he telling us? It's not the amount of faith that matters. Stop thinking of faith as a commodity to grow like your, your investment portfolio. Faith is not a commodity. It's a dynamic. So when, when Jesus says, oh, ye of little faith, he's not talking about a mountain. He's talking about duration. You remember Peter walks out onto the water. He sees Jesus and walking on the water. And so G Jesus says, come on. And Peter jumps out of the boat and he does what? He's walking on water. That's pretty amazing. And then what happens? In the middle of this, he gets his eyes off of Jesus. He looks at his circumstances and he starts to what? Sink. Of course, this is a sermon illustration. It's so perfect. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you'll be walking above your circumstances. Get your eyes on your circumstances and everything that you were finding victory over will now be over your head. Jesus gets into the boat and he goes, oh, ye of little faith. He's not talking about amount. I don't know what the amount of faith was, but for somebody, to, for a human being to jump out onto water and land without sinking, that's remarkable. That's enough faith. And he started taking steps. I believe the exhortation is, hey, Pete, you trusted me for the first step. The second step, why not the 15th? Do you see that faith is a dynamic? It's not like it's a commodity that we, we get enough of. It's a dynamic we get to stay into and grow with as we trust him. Because tomorrow's moment is different than today's moment. And if, you, and if the faith in Christ got you through today's moment, well, tomorrow's coming. So faith is this beautiful dynamic where we trust God at his word. I used to love what Major Ian Thomas would say. He said, faith is taking God at his word and saying thank you. Believing God at his word and saying thank you. And then we know that that, that word for believing in the Greek, it, it's pastuo, and it means it's more than just mental. It's more than just agreement of a certain set of facts. It means taking facts that we agree with, believe, and placing trust, action to it. They said to Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus said, believe in him who sent you, whom he has sent. The, the work of God is to believe Jesus. To place faith in him. Not, not just knowing the facts about him, but actually trusting him. Because look, look what Jesus taught in John 5. You search the scriptures because you think that, that you're going to have eternal life. But you refuse to come to me for that life. Faith is not just believing something. It's placing your trust in someone. Jesus. It's trusting him. In a few weeks, we'll take the high school group to Colorado, and um, we've been doing this for over 20 years now. Every, every few years, we take them there. And I have the pleasure of having led that trip for many years, and now I have the pleasure of not leading that trip, um, but just getting to go. And they have a ropes course, and I remember the first year we were doing this, I was on the ground as our fearless leader and all the kids were up getting harnessed in and they would get on the high ropes and they're scared to death. And from the ground, it doesn't look that high. And I can remember being on the ground, I'm laughing and I'm giggling and I'm, I'm trying to encourage them, but also messing with them a little bit like, oh, I hope they really blade you in right. Like, you know, and so it was all fun and games until, hey, Tim, are you going to do it? And I promise you, I had complete belief in all the equipment, the harnesses, the ropes, the people on the ground that were helping belay these people. I had complete belief that they could do their job and were doing it well as long as somebody else was up there. But at the moment of challenging me, hey, Tim, are you going to do this? Then I had to put faith in it. I had to put faith in it. And I can tell you, 
I can remember putting that harness on and it tightening up and thinking, this is real. And then they have you climb up this ladder, and all of a sudden what didn't look so high from the ground looks super high when you were up there. When I say super high, I mean like I, my legs are shaking, and I'm trying to act cool because I'm supposed to be the leader, and I'm scared to death. It's this amount of faith now. But it's in the security of whatever it's in. And obviously, I'm here today, so I made it. But I'm telling you, with the most shaky faith, with, with nerves and anxiety and, and shakiness, I trusted. Do you realize, I think sometimes we beat ourselves up for not feeling certain things when we're applying faith. We don't need to do that. God's not doing that to us. I, I, I firmly believe that you are trusting God better than you think most of the time. We've just been conditioned to think that, that we're not. You're always in union with him. Hebrews tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's not, a, that's not an accusation coming from God. That's an invitation. That's not God saying, drum up more faith or I won't be pleased. That's God telling you, you've, you've got, you realize you've placed faith in Jesus. Your eternal security is, is, is set. You've had a, just a little bit of faith to place in him for all of eternity. How about just a little bit of faith for all the temporary stuff? When God says without faith it's impossible to please him, he's not saying he's impossible to please. He's telling you how simple it is to please him. Hearing and believing. Hearing and believing. I hear you, God. I hear you in this moment. You love me. You accept me. I believe you. My feelings want to tell me this. My feelings want to, or, or the enemy wants to lie to me and say this. I hear you, God. I believe you. If you're a believer in Christ, you've done this. And, and you get to continue doing this. I think sometimes we... We listen to this world so much. We, this world will tell you that seeing is believing, but without faith, believing, but, but, but with faith, believing is actually seeing. I can remember when I was being taught who I am in Christ. I was never taught that growing up. It wasn't until I got into college and I went to some retreat with Campus Crusade and some quirky guy named Frank Friedman started teaching and he was teaching, and he was passionate, and, and it was stuff I had never heard before. But I didn't really know what I was hearing. But man, he was saying something about me in Jesus that was different than what I had ever believed. I had believed what I was supposed to believe. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And now the rest of my Christian life is this work of me stop trying to be a sinner and try to get in God's good graces. And Frank was saying something radically different. And I couldn't even put all the, uh, nowhere near the theology to it, but I can tell you what it was, what it was, how it was impacting me to start listening to hearing and believing if what he was saying was the truth. And I was searching it out to see if it was true. And I couldn't refute it. And I'd come to Frank and I'd ask some questions. I'm sure he got tired of it. But I had questions. But, but the more I heard it and the more I was taking the risk of believing it over and against what I had believed, over and against how I felt. Wait, God, you're pleased with me? I get so disappointed with me. See, see the world says seeing is believing, but faith says believing is seeing. If you will believe him, you'll start to see this. And I can tell you 25 years later, I have not arrived, and I'm not so sure we're ever supposed to arrive because it's a dynamic. Life with Jesus is not an equation, it's a relationship. And, and, and just like life with my wife, it's not an equation. If I do all the right things, she responds all the right ways. It's a dynamic where we learn to love one another and we learn how to do this together. Faith, I, I want to say, does not imply there is no evidence, just that we don't have to understand all the evidence. Did you hear that? Faith, does, faith is not without evidence. God has made it evident like I said, if he's telling the truth, and he is, by the way, he's made it evident. Romans 1 says so. He's made it specifically evident to the body of Christ by revelation of Jesus. 
Faith doesn't imply there is no evidence, just we don't have to understand all the evidence because we have been wired by God that our capacity for faith is actually greater than our capacity for understanding. Do you believe that? That you have a greater capacity to to believe and trust than you do for understanding what you believe and trust. It happens every day in my life. I I can tell you, I, I fully place faith in things that I don't understand at all. My car, my computer, my wife. Let's go to my car, it's safer. I, I, I place faith in my car, but if it breaks down, I'll tell you what I understand. I don't understand how to fix it. I got to call somebody else that does. But I refuse to enjoy the benefit of what the car will offer to me just because I lack the understanding of how it works. Our capacity for faith is greater than what we can understand. And we don't have to wait to understand everything about God or from God in order to trust him. To to do so would be to limit our experience of him. To do so is a revelation really of our pride. Unless I understand this. Have you ever tried to convince somebody about their mind and understanding intellectually all the things that actually we have to take by faith? But, But faith does never imply that there's no evidence. Faith isn't having to figure it all out. God doesn't say understand him. He says trust him. There's freedom when we believe that. Faith is not a lack of common sense. It's not presumption. It's not magical or mystical. It's super practical. And it makes sense if God is telling the truth. Little children do this all the time. It's why Jesus said, become like a little kid. They understand nothing. (laughs) Right? Little kids understand nothing. But they trust mom and dad. They trust mom and dad. It's amazing. Jesus has become like a little kid. Faith is not its own object. Actually, the value, the the validity of faith is coming from the object. Jesus is the object of our faith. You can put great faith in a bad object and it will serve you no good. And you can put little faith in a great object and it will serve you well. It's not about our faith. That's just simply hearing and believing. It's about Him. In Him you also, as you heard the the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed. Gosh. With the promised Holy Spirit. This is so incredibly powerful. There's no way to really explain this uh, fully to where where we, we, we get it completely. But just look at the language. First, I want you to notice that you were sealed. I've heard people say that, the, that our spirit was sealed. It doesn't say that. That would imply that there's a part of you that's sealed, and then the other parts are exposed, not protected. You, the child of God, the saint, the righteous one, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's beautiful. God sealing you means that he has secured you and he has protected you. Much much like the sealing of a letter is to ensure its protection. God has ensured your protection, your salvation by sealing you. This seal also signifies ownership. It's like the ancient signet ring that identified ownership and belonging. And, and, And the Bible says that you belong to God, 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that you were bought at a price? He owns you. Not in a controlling way, in a protective and secure way. Nobody else can steal you or snatch you. You are God's. And not only does he own you, he's placed his seal of approval over you. The sealing of the Holy Spirit implies that the authenticity. That that we can, just like if you've ever gotten anything notarized, it means that that somebody identified that all the prerequisites of making sure this, this transaction is finalized, they put their seal on it to confirm that or affirm that. 
You realize when it says you are sealed by the Spirit, it's confirmation of God's protection, of God's ownership, of the authenticity of the salvation. We are guaranteed this. And it proves that it's a finished tra transaction. It's finalized. You've been sealed. There's no guesswork left. Now, we don't have the pressure of trying to get saved, stay saved, or become saved anymore. We have His Word. And if we will listen, hear, and believe it, we get the comfort, the security, the confirmation of knowing I get to live securely on planet Earth knowing that this is forever eternally secure because I've been sealed. It actually brings, it lets me have this foundation to stand on as I live in the insecurity of this world. And there's no behavior, there is no attitude, there is nothing you can do to change this. Because there was nothing you did to do this. Notice it's done by the Spirit. You are sealed. I love that. And one day you'll be delivered. And, and the difference between that day and this day is today we have this pledge or this, this deposit. That's what Ephesians 1.14 says, and this spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That inheritance is the, is the rest of what God has promised to those who are saved. Right now, you have a down payment, a pledge. The Holy Spirit is our earnest money in a sense. He's our guarantee. It, some, one of your versions, I think it's the New American Standard says, he's the first installment. But do you know what the finish of this is? You know what we're going to inherit one day? You've already been given life. You've already been given forgiveness. You've already been given the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is the guarantee, the pledge, the deposit, the first down payment that the rest is coming. And you know what the rest is? It's unopposed presence with God and not in this body but a new one not in a body of vulnerability not in a body of weakness in a transformed resurrected body that has yet to come aren't we the living proof of that but one day that will come too you'll gain possession of it I love the Amplified here. It says, The Spirit is the guarantee, the first installment, the pledge, a foretaste of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own purchased possession, His believers, to the praise of His glory. He, the Holy Spirit, is the down payment. Not your works, not your, not your religious activities. The down payment of the security of guaranteeing that heaven is yours and a new body will be the rest of your inheritance is that the Holy Spirit is in you. It's all up to him. It's why, it's why Hebrews tells us that by two unchangeable things, we have been secured forever, and you can hold this as an anchor of your soul. Your salvation rests in God and God alone. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy. I just, want you, I just want to ask you who's doing what here. According to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled. Will not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. We talked about that last week. God's made this reservation. He knows how to hold it. It's not a Seinfeld episode who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be reveal, revealed in the last day. You are protected by God through the practical vehicle of your faith. You, you hear and believe Him? You trust Him? You're protected by God. And, and three times we saw this phrase, to the praise of His glory, that God does everything after His own glory. It, it's not a selfishness. It's the glory of God is the expression, the, the, the manifestation of his character, his love, his grace. He does everything 
everything to glorify himself. So that in that glorifying himself, we experience who he is. God's greatest glory is to secure you and to to make sure that you know that no matter what, no matter what this world throws at you, no matter what you do, no matter what the enemy says, no matter how you feel, God's greatest glory is that you would know that Christ, Christ is your security. Next week, we'll look at this beautiful prayer where he prays that the eyes of our heart will be enlightened to all of this. Father, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. Father, it it is amazing to see the simplicity of the gospel. That you would offer not just a place for us, but you would offer yourself to us. And Father, in doing so, you would offer that for all eternity and especially for our time on this planet where we could walk in union with you. And, then, and Father, that that's not a false promise that the walk of this world is easy or that the things of this world change necessarily. But that in walking with you, we are okay. And that you've got us. And Father, in this beautiful relationship we get to claim we have you too. And that one day, Father, that all of this, all of this will come to fullest expression without any hindrance. We praise you for that. And it's to the praise of your glory that we take and say thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen and amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.